I appreciate the chance to be here. Um, so right now you should be looking at one of our tall ships, which is kind of the cool thing that we're known for at, um, at SCA or the Sea Education Association. So we're in our 50th year of running programs on tall ships focused on marine and environmental sciences. So it's a long-term collaboration that we've got with the ocean and we'd be excited to talk a little bit about our programs. But I also thought as a marine scientist, I could talk to you a little bit about my career path as well. So whatever the audience is, you might be able to get something different out of it. So there's the beautiful ship, the Corwith Kramer, which is uh, 134 feet long, and it's home ported in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, the oceanographic community that's famous for the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and the Marine Biological Laboratory, among many others. Uh, so we're right here on Cape Cod. I'm looking out at a rainy day here on campus, but um, it's an exciting place to work and I uh, want to tell you more about it. So this is kind of what I do. That's me in the middle, the old person. And uh, I take young people out on the ship and we teach them about the ocean, about navigation, about leadership, and about science and humanities. So this is a group of students. We're out on the what's known as the quarter deck of the tall ship. And we're, uh, we're learning how to navigate by the stars. So I'm teaching them a little bit about celestial navigation. And our programs feature up to 25 students at a time from a wide variety of institutions inside and outside the United States. And uh, the students will all kind of spend about six weeks here on campus on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And then we'll spend six weeks on the vessel sailing anywhere from New Zealand to Tahiti, to the Caribbean, to New England, to Hawaii, et cetera, um, doing the academic programs. And that's what I love doing. I love being out on the water, doing the teaching out there um, because I was a marine scientist as well. And so I got my start, um, and this is kind of some of the stuff that we do on the ships. So you can see the beautiful ship there, and our students are responsible for running the ship, all of the shipboard operations, as well as collecting all the data, analyzing it, and then presenting it. So you can see some students on the right there using a CTD, conductivity temperature density sensor, to collect data out there on the water. But I got my start at the US Coast Guard Academy, and I know there's going to be a presentation later in the day from the Coast Guard Academy. So if any of this interests you, I'd encourage you to check that out. And the US Coast Guard Academy is located in New London, Connecticut, and it's a military academy, just like the Air Force Academy or the Naval Academy or West Point. Um, and you are um, a military member, so you, you kind of show up at the college. And down in the lower left, they yell at you a lot and you do push ups and stuff. It's it's fine. It's kind of a fun game, but they do have a marine and environmental science major. And the college is located right along the Thames River in Connecticut on Long Island Sound. So you can go out on the research vessel, collect data, um, do projects. And for me, I specialized in chemical and ocean and physical oceanography. So you can choose between chemical, physical and biological oceanography, pick two out of three. And for instance, my project as a senior was I took sediment samples from the Thames River near the Naval Submarine Lab, and I analyzed them for heavy metals in the sediment. So I was curious if the paint from the boat falls off into the sediment and how long it sticks around. So I used inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy to, to kind of do that, and uh, it was a great project. And so as an undergrad um, at the Coast Guard Academy, not only do you get the military education, but you get the marine and environmental science education as well. The nice part about the Coast Guard Academy, it's free. So the government pays for you to go there. You have to pay a very small amount for, for a computer and whatnot, but um, you kind of get in on your merit and then you pay with your, with your life. At the, you, know, you, you have to dedicate service afterwards. And so after I graduated from the Coast Guard Academy, I had to work for five years in the Coast Guard as an officer to kind of pay back that education. It seems like a good deal to me because it's a great job and it's really fun. And so what I did as a Coast Guard officer after graduation is I was a fisheries law enforcement officer. So what I did is I, I, I went out on these boats. Down on the left is a 282-foot ship in Alaska. And up on the right is a 110-foot ship in Maine. And I was stationed in many, many places, Hawaii, California, um, Maine, Connecticut, Alaska, and North Carolina. Um, and my job was to go out and make sure that the fisheries were protected. And that was very, very important to me as a marine scientist in school to make sure that the, the fish were protected because I care a lot about them. And so um, my job was kind of twofold. One was to level the playing field and make sure that any fisher that's going out there on the water has an equal chance to collect fish um, or not for their livelihood. So nobody should have an advantage. And the second 
mission that I had was to protect the resource. So you can see on the left, up on the top, our fisheries law enforcement officers were going out on the boats and making sure that the equipment on the vessels was correct. So for instance, if you're collecting fish with a net, you need to make sure that the mesh size is appropriate. We don't wanna be catching things that we're not targeting, that's called bycatch. And so as the fisheries law enforcement officer, I spent 12 years in the Coast Guard um, working my way up to be the captain of some of these Coast Guard ships and a law enforcement officer along the way. So it was a great way to, to parlay my undergraduate education into a career. And so for me, the leadership and the marine and environmental sciences thing is very, very important. Next, I had a chance to go to graduate education. And so I went to the Oregon State University and there was a presentation just a few minutes ago from Oregon State, so maybe you checked that out. Um, and I got my master's degree in fisheries and wildlife administration. And I did another master's at the Naval War College, which doesn't really matter for this presentation, but you can continue your education kind of in the Coast Guard. And there came a time when I wanted to leave the Coast Guard and um, I found myself wanting to kind of combine my passions of fisheries and science and policy and the leadership and going to sea. And so I ended up at Sea Education Association right here as a captain for one of the tall ships. And what do we do? We take the young students out on college um, voyages of discovery, high school, gap and college, uh, focused on climate change, biodiversity, sustainability, uh, engineering, science, et cetera. And so this is a picture right here of the tall ship anchored at Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha'apai volcano in 2019. So if you recently followed the news, that volcano um, exploded and it's no longer there. And so we got to explore that volcano with our students focused on marine geology. At the time, we worked closely with NASA to fly drones over the island. And it turns out that NASA used that information to help the Ingenuity Flyer on Mars learn how to be kind of artificially intelligent. So it was a really great mission for us and great for our students to be a part of that. Our programs at SEA right now are kind of focused on um, creating ocean scholars, stewards, and people who are very passionate about the ocean and protecting it. If you're interested in kind of getting on the water and learning about the ocean, this is, this is the place to do it. So students will come to campus here on Woods Hole in Cape Cod for six weeks, and they'll take some classes in our classroom, such things as, um, you know, biological oceanography, chemical, physical oceanography, but also marine policy, advanced policy research, humanities courses, and leadership courses all focused on the ocean. So students will get up to 17 or 18 credits through Boston University, our kind of affiliate, um, and they're all focused on the ocean. So if you wanna study like for an entire semester about the ocean, this is the place for you. The programs are all kind of a mix of three things. One is leadership, kind of the teamwork element. You can see that these people are, are pulling on a line on the ship and you can't do it by yourself. You have to work as a team. Um, the second element is maritime studies or the humanities and policy associated with the ocean. And the third is oceanography itself, chemical, physical, biological, and geological oceanography. Every program has a mix of those. They're just kind of tweaked a little bit from program to program. For instance, our ocean exploration program is focused on students who are either gap year students or maybe in their second or third year of undergrad education, and they're looking for a survey course about the ocean. So you'll take some, some courses focused on that. And then this fall, you could be sailing that tall ship from Cape Cod down to St. Croix in the Caribbean, collecting data along the way and earning 18 credits. We've got other programs, for example, Marine Biodiversity and Conservation, which is about to start on Monday here on Cape Cod. And those students are upper level science students in undergraduate education. And they are looking at genetics and biodiversity of the Sargasso Sea, including all the eDNA and kind of um, the, the creatures that are located in the Sargasso Sea, including seaweed and, and you know, phytoplankton and zooplankton and whatnot. So a really high level science program for them. But again, we've also got programs that are focused on the humanities. So for instance, a program called Climate and Society works on our ship in New Zealand. And you can study how climate change affects the population of New Zealand and Polynesia um, through a, an 18 credit semester as well. There's always a mix of oceanography, humanities and nautical science or leadership. Uh, each one is just a little bit different depending on the program that you're sitting, that you're sailing on. We also have summer programs for high schoolers. So this summer we've got um, what six programs focused on 
on high schoolers from uh, programs that are on land, programs that are on sea, programs that are online, as well as um, gap year and undergrad students as well. So wherever you're at, um, we've got kind of a program for you. Um, here's our campus on Woods Hole, and you get that lovely sign hung out when you show up. So it's a nice historic building. You live in uh, um, in the Woods Hole Oceanographic Community. So right down the road is the Marine Biological Laboratory, Woods Hole Oceanographic, a host of other schools uh, focused on climate change and ocean research. And you get to explore Cape Cod. I will say in the summer, it's pretty nice. In the winter, yeah. It's a little boring, but that's okay. Uh, you also live in these cottages here on campus. And so you'll be living and working with your shipmates, your classmates to make meals and kind of um, work as a group to make sure that all of the needs of the community are met so that we can learn effectively. So it's not just college, it's kind of a whole study abroad experience as well. Um, so during, and I'll just go back to this for a minute. During the land component, it's about six weeks here on Cape Cod. We've got field trips to many places in New Bedford, in Boston, in Woods Hole itself. We can use the Marine Biological Laboratory, kind of make networking and partnerships with these professional oceanographers and, and policymakers uh, that are gonna kind of further your career. And during classes, it's a full day of class. You'll be studying those subjects that I mentioned earlier and kind of um, getting yourself ready so that when you go to the ship, you can be an effective learner. And the ship component or the sea component is kind of what it's all about. Everything that you've been studying leads up to this moment. You're going to step on, on, on board this vessel and you're going to be responsible for kind of running it and collecting all the data that's associated with the voyage. So whether you're hardcore into science as an upper level college student, or you're just exploring options as a gap student or an early undergrad student, there are programs for you and you'd be among like-minded students as well. So part of being the ship's crew is you do have to run the vessel. So not only do you learn about science, but you learn about research vessel operations. We happen to do it under sail, but it's the same principle as going out on any of Huey's boats out there that I can pretty much see from here um, on oceanographic voyages. So you'll be doing things like steering the vessel, navigating the vessel, standing lookout duty, collecting all of the science and running the laboratory under the supervision of our professional scientists, as well as uh, working in the engine room and in the galley to, to run that ship. Um, so it's kind of a cool experience. During COVID-19, a few things have changed. Hopefully we're kind of coming out of that right now, but um, we have shifted to domestic programs for the year 2022. Um, however, we just had our ship go to Palmyra Atoll out in the Pacific. So we've got plenty of, um, of places where we can explore and, uh, and, and, you know, even in the COVID pandemic, we've been running programs for, um, for the past two years successfully and have kept kind of COVID out of the, the program. I do see a question in the Q&A um, regarding um, deadlines for international applicants. And, and first of all, we do accept international students, no, no problem at all. We've had students from over 50 countries and from over 300 colleges around the world. Um, our deadlines are pretty much the same for international and domestic students. As long as you can get your life in order to get your visa if necessary, um, we'd be happy to sail with you. And we try and have deadlines about two months before the programs kick off. So if you're interested in the fall, sailing this fall in the Northern Hemisphere, I should say, um, October, September timeframe, you should wanna get your application in in the early part of the summer. So thanks for the question, um, I appreciate that. Um, and so speaking of our voyages, sorry, um, we've got these two amazing ships. One ship is called the Robert C. Siemens. It's named after a NASA administrator, and it is um, located in the um, Pacific Ocean. So it's home ported in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, but it sails in the Pacific exclusively. And it runs programs. Let's see if I can point over my head here. This is a real screen behind me too. It's not fake. So there's Hawaii. There's New Zealand and, and Tahiti is kind of like over here somewhere. And it runs missions between Hawaii, New Zealand and Tahiti. It makes a big loop every year between those three destinations. And each one of those legs is a semester. So for instance, if you wanted to, to sail from Hawaii to New Zealand, you could join a program called SPICE or Sustainability in, in Pacific Island Cultures and Ecosystems. Or if you wanted to sail from New Zealand to Tahiti, in the deep blue ocean where there's like no land around and just collect like tons and tons of oceanographic data, you could sail on a program called Oceans and Climate, a science-focused program um, focused on climate change specifically. 
So this vessel uh, has a crew of up to 40 total people, including staff and students. And uh, it's gonna be a student body of about 25. The ship is 134 feet long. It weighs 250 tons or so, and it's a Coast Guard inspected vessel. And it just goes out there and does science stuff out on the ocean. It's pretty cool. I love it. Our other vessel is the Corwith Kramer, which was named after the founder of Sea Education Association. And this vessel is in the Atlantic Ocean. So it runs programs between New England, Cape Cod, and the Caribbean, such as um, St. Croix, St. Thomas, um, other, other nations in the Caribbean basin as well. We often take the ship to Dominica, um, Antigua, Barbuda, um, Montserrat, Grenada, for instance, um, and the British Virgin Islands as well. And so we kind of collect data in those different places. The ship then sails to Florida through areas like uh, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, uh, the Cayman Islands, Jamaica, Cuba, and then back to Florida, and then up to New England for the summertime. So typically our high school programs are run in the summer on the Corps with Kramer in New England, and our semester programs are run everywhere else. So for instance, this fall, you could be sailing from New England to St. Croix on a voyage focused on GAP and kind of second or third year students interested in a survey program about the ocean. Or in the winter, you could be sailing a trip from say Key West to, um, to the North Atlantic into, into New England focused on genetics and biodiversity of the Sargasso Sea. In between, there's a program focused on humanities in the Caribbean, uh, sailing through Dominican Republic, you know, Cuba, Haiti, Jamaica, et cetera, focused on kind of how the Caribbean basin had been colonized and then how that has shifted into a conservation mindset. So some of the lasting impacts of Western colonization of these regions. So it's a very interesting approach. And all of these programs do have a mixture of humanities, science, and leadership as well. What is life at sea like? Oh my goodness, I love it. That's why I do it. So um, like I said, I got my start in the Coast Guard. So I was familiar with going to, sh going to sea on military vessels. And I worked my way up to being a captain of, um, of those vessels as well. And then I joined the, the Sea Education Association because I was interested in combining my passions of marine science, which I did as an undergraduate, to um, the passions that I learned in graduate school, fisheries, conservation, and policy, as well as the leadership elements of life at sea. So you can see this student here is climbing up the rigging to help set some sails. You don't have to do that. It's an optional activity, but it's kind of cool. And you get to experience that historic look at conducting oceanographic research on a sailing vessel. And that's how we all got our start. The early voyages of Western discovery were on vessels of sail. So Nansen and um, you know scientists like that um, all were, were sailing. So it's kind of a cool way to combine the passions if you'd like to go to sea. Here's some students doing student things. You know, there's plenty of time to hang out and, uh, and have fun on the vessel as well. But you can see the student in the back there has a yellow safety harness on. And that student is, is standing the lookout watch. So they're working and uh, the rest of the students are kind of off duty having fun. So it's not all work, it's a lot of play as well. Our vessels do conduct port visits in different locations. Um, so for instance, New Zealand, Tahiti, Hawaii, et cetera. Also um, places in between, including the Phoenix Islands in the Republic of Kiribati. Uh, we go there every year as well. California, uh, the vessel occasionally goes to San Francisco and San Diego. Um, so you may actually have seen the Robert C. Siemens if you are with the Ocean Institute recently. Um, on Catalina Islands, the vessel was there. And in the Atlantic, again, port calls, including islands in the Caribbean, including you know, Bermuda, uh, north of the Caribbean basin, Florida, uh, New England, um, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Dominica, Grenada, Antigua, Barbuda, et cetera. So a lot of great places to go and get some time ashore. These students here are kind of working on um, setting sails on the vessel. And again, it's not just about the data, it's about running the vessel as well. And so they're working together to set the sails on the ship and you'll learn how to sail the tall ship. A common question you might have is, is that, do you have to have sailing experience? No, not at all. Um, most of our students arrive without sailing experience at all. And we kind of teach them what they need to know along the way. So it's pretty fun. That's my favorite part is the sailing, but I also love the science and policy. 
So this person here on the right is teaching a student how to navigate. So you'll learn how to navigate using the stars, the planets, the moon, and the sun, uh, which is known as celestial navigation. So there's a good component of mathematics in that as well. Technically, it's spherical trigonometry, if you believe in the whole spherical Earth conspiracy. I'm not sure about that. But uh, yeah, so if you are sailing on the ocean, um, spherical trigonometry is a part of the, the math component as well. And you're also, you know, collecting science data out there as well. So these students here are deploying a CTD off a wire deployment, so a conductivity temperature density sensor, and um, they're collecting projects, project data on a wide variety of topics uh, that you can see on the screen there. But I've seen students do really, really cool projects focused on specifically things that we're known for at SEA, including marine pollution and microplastics, as well as biological data, um, everything from sargassum, which is a seaweed in the Atlantic, to, um, you know, mctophids and, and chemical analysis of the ocean, uh, geological sampling of the bottom, um, and, and, and all things in between. So great number of projects that students have done. Here's just a list of some of our research themes, if you're interested in those. And uh, I did mention plastics this summer. It's not too late to apply for a, a berth on our ship in the Pacific, which will be sailing from Hawaii to San Diego through the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, if you followed that in the news. And we'll be focusing that voyage on marine microplastics. You'll be sailing with some professional scientists who are doing this for a living. You'll be collecting data and working on your own project as well. And unfortunately, there you can see some marine debris out there in the Pacific. Um, that we would be that we would be studying on that mission. Here's a few papers that our students have uh, had published, you know, from different journeys. Uh, so geographic and size description of microplastics in the North Pacific, uh, everything from spatial distribution of air CCO2 flux in the South Pacific Ocean, which is more of a chemical, physical, physical uh, climate change focused project. And then finally, distribution and population dynamics of sargassum, which is a seaweed. It's, it sounds a lot more boring than it is. It's really a fun kind of topic, but uh, kind of the genetic diversity of these um, plant life in the, in the Pacific, in the ecosystems that they support. So kind of some cool projects there. We also do projects in marine policy as well. So you can, um, you know, you can not just collect data, but apply that. And so here's a couple of projects developing Kiribati energy uh, infrastructure sustainability. So we often sail our ship through the Republic of Kiribati in the Pacific, and we have a lot of partners there. Um, and so there was a paper that came out of that, uh, making a case for Sargasso Sea Regional Management Commission. So thinking about, you know, protecting the ocean through marine protected areas or seasonal or, or you know, dynamic marine protected areas is something that our students have pushed really hard for. And they actually spoke at the United Nations about this a few years ago. And then finally, marine biodiversity conservation regarding fish policy and in Samoa, um, kind of the marine policy elements to conservation as well. So we do take our ship to American Samoa, um, Pongo Pongo um, each year as well. I do see a question regarding um, applying to these programs. So it's a very easy thing to remember if you've got a piece of paper out or anything, I can also put in the chat, but it's, uh, it's sea.edu. So www.sea edu and we are c education association and you can kind of apply for these programs on that website whether you're an undergrad or a gap year student or a high school student as well so the high school programs are very popular i'd encourage you to get your application in uh, right away if you want but uh, we do have room for for high schoolers both on the ship and on land we run a, a summer science camp here on cape cod and you'll get to kind of mingle with all the people at, at hui and um and the marine biological laboratory as well all right. Um, and so, yeah, I was just going to run through some frequently asked questions, but if you do have questions, that's kind of the end of my fixed presentation. And if you wanted to uh, drop anything into the chat um, or answer or ask a question in the, the Whova q and A, I'd be happy to, to answer that as well. So how far in advance should you submit your application? Well, um, you know, up to a year in advance, you can kind of get started. However, um, really up to about a month or two before the, um, the program begins, applications are accepted. And I, I do see a question, Trish, th thanks for how are students actually selected for the programs? Um, it is a rolling application basis and we will review um, letters of recommendation, your academic record, and kind of your statement of why you want to do the program before making a decision on the acceptance. We are a fairly competitive program, so 
you know, there is some level of competition to getting in. However, there's probably a spot for you on some program in our in our repertoire. So, for instance, if you're interested in the heavy biology program uh, called Marine Biodiversity and Conservation, but maybe you didn't get super awesome grades in your in your lab classes. We might steer you to a different program that's going to be most effective for you. And again, all of the programs deal with marine science policy and leadership as well. So thanks for that question. Um, Trish, I appreciate that. I lost my mouse, sorry, but um, there we go. Um, so yeah, the, the applications are on a rolling basis, you know, as far in advance as possible if you can. The other thing you can do is talk with our admissions counselors and kind of map out a strategy for where in your career this is going to fit. So um, a good chance to kind of check and see if it's better to go your second year or your third year in college or, or something else. Um, I did want to throw a little note in there as well. If you are following the conference in the Whova platform, I did post some job applications in there as well. We're not only looking for gap year high school and college students, we're looking for professional scientists as well who have a degree in marine and environmental science to work as a um, as an assistant scientist on the vessel. So if you've got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in marine science, ecology, any of those kind of fields, we would love to work with you on the vessel as a, as a paid scientist. So there's that opportunity. And if you do happen to be watching with a PhD in uh, chemical, physical, oceanography, um, biological oceanography, we do have faculty positions occasionally available as well. We are looking for a chemical oceanographer faculty member right now, in fact. Um, I do see a question as well regarding having a boating license and would that make you more desirable for opportunities? Um, not necessarily. So as students, no sailing experience is required. Um, so, so the boating experience is helpful, but not required at all. Um, but I would say as a crew member, if you wanted to come back and work with our company as a professional crew member, certainly having a boating license would be helpful. Uh, for me, I'm a Coast Guard certified captain, and all of our mates are legally trained in Coast Guard, um, Coast Guard licensing as well. So there is definitely training that we conduct and that we look for in the, in the navigation world as well. So thanks for that question as well. Um, you know, not required to have the boating training or the sailing training, but um, certainly helpful. Um, one of our common questions that we get is, uh, you know, how many students are there in each program? And it's about 25. And so a wide variety of majors is totally fine. Um, I've worked with students, you know, everything from, from dance majors to literature majors to marine science majors. And there's a program for you on board because each of our programs is a mixture of those three topics. Um, whether it's in the Atlantic, the Pacific, here you're looking at a picture of our ship anchored in, uh, in Kiribati in the Phoenix Islands protected area. We've worked very closely with um, the, the Boston Aquarium and, and Boston University to help get this, uh, you know, um, area dedicated to, to protecting resources. And every year we go collect data and, um, and we do you know, work with them closely. So um, it's a great place to be, to be anchored. Um, I do see another question regarding um, kind of majoring in marine biology and any tips that you might find for research opportunities once you're in college. Well, I have to kind of self-advocate for Sea Education Association. Like, I don't really think there's a better place to, to come as a, as a college student to collect data analyze it, and then you can take that data back and use it as your senior thesis in college if you want. So so, so for you, um, Fatima, it looks like, or I'm sorry, uh, Bet, Betty, um, it looks like, you know, maybe your second year of college would be a great place to, to show up and um, do some research with us. Um, I see a question from, uh, from Fatima. Again, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing a name at all, but uh, thanks for your, your patience there. Um, undergraduate pursuing a degree in marine science, interested in conservation and sustainability. Next steps for master's programs. Well, um, for me, I was in, in your shoes and I chose to go to Oregon State University and work with their College of, of Fisheries and Wildlife uh, Protection. And so that's what I did as a master's degree student. Um, and I highly recommend it. I think it was a great experience. Um, to the element of Sea Education Association for this presentation. If you are interested in kind of gaining that research experience before you go to grad school, I've had a lot of friends and, and shipmates um, work with me as assistant scientists. 
And they'll kind of come to SEA and they'll work here for three or four years. They'll gain all that experience and then they'll go to grad school. So it's a great early career job after your bachelor's degree um, to kind of come up and, and get some experience on the vessel um, before you go off to grad school. So thanks for that question. Um, I do see a question regarding cabins that the students sleep in. You do have a private, um, it's a curtain, it's not a cabin, but you do have a, a private bunk. You won't be sharing with anybody else on the vessel. You kind of close your curtain and uh, that's your private space. It's got electricity inside of it and storage as well for your gear, your books, your clothes, even your musical instrument if you want. Um, so it is your private space. It's not shared um, bunks at all. And you may be familiar with, you know, like racing sailboats where people sleep on bags of stuff. No, you've got a real bunk. It's a nice place. So um, thanks for that. Um, question from, from Ricky regarding where the ships are located. So they're both based out of um, Woods Hole, Massachusetts in the USA. And, um, and so they don't really spend much time there though. So in the Atlantic, the ship sails from Massachusetts to the Caribbean, to Florida and back, and it's always moving. In the Pacific, our ship sails from Hawaii to Tahiti, I'm sorry, Hawaii to New Zealand to Tahiti and back. So always kind of moving. So thanks for that question where the ships are located. Um, and a question regarding the cabins for students in high school. So the high school programs that we offer are a mix. Some of them are on the ship. And so they would be the same bunks that you would have as an undergraduate student with a curtain and some private space. We also have land-based programs here on campus, um, you know, kind of like a summer, summer camp type feel. Um, so, so you would have a private room here on our cottages. Um, there's our cottages down there, you know, beautiful little Cape Cod cottages. Um, and so you would have a private room in there as a high school student um, as well. For the high school sea expedition, you are on the ship. So you would be getting the, the bunk um, with the curtain as well. So thanks for that question. Appreciate it. Um, great. And uh, yeah, I, I do think Thank you for the questions. These are great. It's nice to know you, you're interested. Um, one common question we get is about student support. Like, how are your students supported? What about learning accommodations and physical and mental health and whatnot? We do take that very seriously as a tall ship and specifically as a Coast Guard officer that I was in, the, in, in my first career. Um, safety is very important to me. So we do have physical and mental health resources here on campus. You do have a dedicated resident assistant, we call it a program assistant here living with you on campus to help facilitate all that. And then on the ship, um, you might be worried that when we go out to sea, we don't have medical care. We always have a medical officer on board and we've got a fully stocked um, formulary of, of antibiotics and medica medications and all the kind of common things you would need uh, out there on, on sea. We also have a satellite telephone that we can call back to a doctor or to, you know, your family if um, if you ever needed to do anything, you know, super critical out there on the water. Uh, there is those resources available. Um, great. So I do see another question regarding um, interested in colleges that offer dual degrees. Um, I probably can't offer too much to that question. I appreciate it. We don't we don't grant degrees here at Sea Education Association. We do grant credits. So we've got up to 18 credits through Boston University, or if your college is uh, you know, affiliated with SEA, we are affiliated with over 300 colleges, you can gain uh, credits directly that way. We also um, offer a broad array of financial aid as well. And basically the way that I put it, if you wanna come to SEA, it's gonna happen. We'll, we'll make it happen, assuming you're accepted. Um, we'll work with your home institution to transfer the, the financial aid back and forth. Um, we'll also, you know, look at giving merit and need-based scholarships uh, to do the programs as well. So yeah, thanks for that question. I'm just going to click here. Uh, here's the, oops, sorry. Here's the admissions process. Uh, so if you go to our website, www.sea.edu, you can see that there is, um, you know, a, a variety of forms on there, packing lists and transcripts and whatnot. Um, but here's the formal admissions process. And we do have people really standing by to help take your questions if you have them about applying, uh, whether that is, you know, for, for high school or for GAP or college, um, whatever. We've got people ready to, ready to help answer your questions. I'm also going to put my information in the chat. So if you do have a specific question that you want to send to me, um, you can feel free to do that. 
happy to answer any questions that you have or direct them in the appropriate way. And again, plenty of financial aid available to, um, to kind of help make sure that this can be a positive experience for you. All right. Um, what about after SEA? So you've taken the plunge, haha, and you've come to SEA and you've sailed with us and you've done 18 credits or maybe a gap program or a high school program. What happens afterwards? Well, there you can see uh, Natalie with a quote about life after SEA. Many of the people that I work with are SEA alums, C Education Association alumni that come back to SEA and work, whether that's in the administrative element of our office here or sailing as a captain, a scientist, a mate, an engineer even. Um, so coming back is a great, great way after SEA to kind of get an early career bump. Uh, but likewise, if you didn't have a chance to do SEA as a student, you can still come and work here and gain that research experience after you graduate. And I really think it's such an amazing job for somebody who's 22 or 23 years old, recently graduated from, from college, getting some data, getting some teaching experience, and then going off to grad school if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, here's another quote regarding um, you know, the uh, life after SEA. Oh, and thank you, uh, Ocean Institute friends. I've, I've posted it in the wrong place. Thanks for that. Um, you know, Brendan from Kenyon College has a quote here regarding uh, how employers look at, at SEA uh, for job applications. So, if you can think about after college applying for a job, even if it's not with us, imagine being able to list that you were a student on a seagoing research expedition, you collected data, you ran things, and, and you really got it done. Um, it's going to go really well. I write a lot of recommendations for people um, coming, coming out of SCA looking for grad school or jobs. And the thing that I love to say in those applications is, you know, the best indicator of future performance is past performance. So if you've done an amazing job in the past, you're probably going to do an amazing job in the future too. People don't necessarily change too much in that regard. So if I can write you a letter that you did an amazing job on our ship, like think about that, all the research that you did, the vessel operations, the leadership, the teamwork, it's going to be a, a good thing for your employers to kind of check out for sure. All right. Well, that is the last slide that I have. So I'll just leave you with a beautiful look at the uh, the vessel, the core with Kramer, which is in the Atlantic. It's a 134 foot tall ship, um, 134 foot long tall ship with sails, a crew of about 15 people, around 25 students. We go out and we do science and data collection and marine policy. We work as a team and we all become friends and, um, and just kind of have that learning community on the vessel. So I don't know why you wouldn't want to do the program, but if you do have questions, let me know for sure. I'd be happy to stick around. And uh, But that's all I had to say um, for now. So I'll kind of stand by for questions and I appreciate your attendance at this session. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. That was, I I want to go do it. All I right. mean, is there an age limit? Are you too old to do it? <laughs> Not really. Yeah. So, um, so you can come and work here. We do have some adult education programs as well. They're not very frequent, but um, yeah, I can, I can imagine, you know, seeing that and saying, oh, I, I didn't have a chance to do it when I was younger in life. How can I do it now? So some of those programs or yeah, employment coming back um, yeah. as well. So yeah. yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for the support with the questions. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Um, we had a lot of questions coming through Wuba and I will take Chris's information that he put in the chat box and I'll put it on his speaker profile so that you guys can come back and um, check out their website. And if you have any questions for him, you can reach out to him. Um, but if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll give um, people a few moments to do that. And if not, then we will sign off and you guys can be on to your next sessions. Great. Thank you. Um, looks like there's a question in the, the chat there from Seth. Um, mm -hmm. What times of day to be available for the online summer program? So that's a great question. And Seth, we're, um, we're very conscious of our partners internationally. And so we will have students coming to us from the Caribbean, from Europe, and from Kiribati in the Pacific, which is pretty far out there um, in time zone. So we're trying to make sure that our courses can be asynchronous if necessary. The core business hours for course though, would be um, East Coast USA hours of about 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for classes. However, um, our instructors are very flexible and depending on the admission process, we might choose to put you in one program or another, depending on what topic is being taught. And, um, 
where the students are located as well. So thanks for that uh, question. I appreciate that. I'll be teaching the, the high school programs as well for the nautical science. So maybe I'll see you again. <laughs> Yeah, this is a real map behind me. I was uh, oftentimes in, in Zoom, you have that like fake map behind. Um, this one is uh, in our map room here on campus. And so you can see we've got you know some pictures of our voyages going on and uh, our classroom over there. And then this map is uh, chlorophyll A concentrations um, in the world. And so we call it the map room because it's got a big map on it. And so you can see um, some of the biological oceanography resources that are, uh, you know, or images that are available in the world. All right, well, not seeing any other questions coming on in. I appreciate your, your time today. Um, I will stick around a few more minutes if there are any others. Awesome, well, thank you again, Chris. It was a really great presentation. Um, and if you guys do have more questions, feel free to use the WUVA app. You can actually ask them on this session there and you'll be able to, um, Chris can go in and even answer them. So maybe he'll check it a little bit later and see if more questions have come in. But again, we wanna thank our sponsors, the Surf um, Industry Members Association, as well as the Maritime College State University of New York. So we will see you in some other sessions later today. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.